and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? I've been told the inside of my belly button tastes like mayonnaise. And who told you that? And um, you know what? No, I don't want to know. I don't want to know who told you. I don't want to know the circumstances. I don't want to know why you're putting mayonnaise in your belly button. Um, I didn't say I put mayonnaise in my belly button. I just said someone tell me it tastes like it. Well, so you've been putting eggs and uh, oil into your belly button and jogging. You are assuming quite a lot. Yes, I am. I know how mayonnaise is made. No, I meant the whole jogging thing. Well, you got to shake it up somehow. Shake it up. Doo, 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 doo. I doubt you're putting an immersion blender in your belly button. But you'll be happy to know. I actually gave away copies of Worldwide News. Oh, you did? I did. Because as you know, this here, I'll be I'll be gapping a little bit about the uh, MCBA Spring Con. Notice since uh, the whole uh, San Diego taking over the Comic Con like on that the uh, Spring Con, Fall Con icons have come back. They went back to the names that I created back in 1988. Yep. Such as uh, the Fall Comic Con, or is it Comic Con? Either way, is Me going to be Thomas. October 5th, 2019, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. I'm, I'm busy. And that, of course, will be at the State Fair Education Building. Because you need to get educated. You do. And uh, while everybody, of course, is in their Odin sleep because they knocked it out of the ballpark and had a fantastic con. Uh, you know, I put up the, the Falcon thing so people can start planning because I'll have to plan that, too, because right now I've got weekends off. But when uh, I'll have a new bid between then and now for my shift at work and I may not end up uh, actually getting that day off, but I do plan to have it off. Uh, I did talk with uh, Pat Gruber. He's not going to have another final, 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 final sale. Uh, but maybe next year. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and if he does, I'll probably grab a table with him and just uh, bring some stuff out to sell. So, well, as long as I started talking comms. Well, I, I wanted to ask, how did the uh, charity table go? We we rocked it out. Uh, the first day, we did about twenty three hundred bucks. Wow, phenomenal! Uh, didn't do as good the second day, but we did blow a lot of stuff out. It's kind of become the norm where we on the first day we we sell all the cool stuff and 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 uh, you know try to make the monies. The charities, of course, were the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund and the Hero Initiative. Uh, I do know the auction, the art auction that went on, and I'll talk a little bit about that because I, I actually won something. Uh, they did really well. I didn't get a total, but they did for the I think third year sell everything. That's great. Which, yeah, and because that was one of the reasons the booth was made was because they had all this leftover stuff and they didn't know what to do. But the, the crowd was came to buy and they came to do stuff. I, I got wonderful, wonderful donations from people. I, I mentioned a few at the last podcast. Uh, you know, my partner, Pat Gruber, donated a bunch of stuff. Uh, Dreamhaven Books in Dinky Town. Uh, I talked to The Source. Uh I donated, of course, tons of stuff, most of the stuff from my my old comic book shops. Uh, Greg Ketter, I already mentioned Dreamhaven, they, they donated stuff. Uh, Solar and Collectibles donated a bunch of uh, Hot Wheels that went over really well. Uh, there was also uh, a buddy of mine who collected knickknacks in that. And, uh, that How about Paddywax? Side... Does he collect Paddywax? Well, that's why he got out of it, because he didn't collect the Paddywax. Nobody wants knickknacks without Paddywax. I mean, would you bone? would you give your starving dog a rubber bone? Are you that type of rat bastard, Corey? I don't have a dog. See, you you already know your limitations, good man. Uh, we did have a lot of fun. Uh, my f whole family was there, including the girls' boyfriends. And uh, Chris came the second day, which helps because we blew it out. You know, she's she's queen of the, the blowout stuff. You know. Now uh, I gotta ask. Uh, when we did it, it was uh, name your price. And then when your daughter took over, she said, no, that's stupid. Yeah, they. she did not have the, uh, the uh, how would we say, gumption, the stupidity, the, uh, the, the 
uh, elegance. There you go. Of, of, of forcing people's brain to work in reverse. Because usually you walk up and it's like, how much is it? Oh, would you take this? And we're like, oh, we. I did get to do that a few times because there were a few items that we didn't put a price on. For example, Dana had these size nine shoes back when she could fit her feet in size nine that she, uh, Christy did it with tables, like shellacked comic book panels onto them. Oh, okay. And they looked really cool. And they were like one of those items that were just so incredibly uh, unique. We didn't put a price on it. We just had people looked at them. Uh, a lot of the, the women there thought about it. But when they realized what size it was, they, they passed. And we might still have them. I, I, I don't have an inventory of what, what's left over. And I'll, I'll get into that as I, as I start talking about what, what happened with the con. So wait, wait. You're saying that uh, Dana has big feet. No, sh she did not say... Uh, whether her feet got bigger or smaller. See, you got to you got to watch how these women work. Very sneaky. Well, you know what they say. I don't listen to me. Big shoes and gloves. Uh, it could be because once she learned how to wear her gloves, she stopped getting cold hands in the wintertime. So oh, that, that, that was going. Well, one thing that was fun, Kelly gave us a bunch of the MCBA pins and he said, just get rid of them because they're going to have new merchandise coming in next year. Uh, so we, instead of trying selling them, which we had been doing the last couple of years, we just, anytime you bought something, you uh, you got one free. And then, of course, towards the end of the con, we, we just would start dumping them on the freebie table and they all just evaporate. So, so that was kind of cool. Uh, we had some left of the Harley Quinn glasses that they were selling. I don't know if you ever got one, Corey. If you're interested, I'll, I'll get you one because uh, we just want to make sure everybody that... Uh, Oh, how could I forget? Alan Payne from Dynamite gave us a bunch of uh, uh, variant covers that re went really well, as well as Kelly White. So it was kind of kind of interesting. The the top contributors to the MCBA charity booth were either co-founders or current volunteers. There you go. That's how it should be. So that was kind of fun. And then all the you donated some DVDs and stuff, and they all they're not in the inventory, so somebody did pick them up. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, we had the table. I think I've posted a picture online of what it looks like. If not, I'll, I'll find one and, and post it on the uh, on our Crazy Comics and Stories uh, uh, Facebook page so people can see it. But, yeah, we had the books and a lot of older books that my uh, father-in-law donated. Not He didn't really donate them. He just kind of dumped them off in our garage. <laughs> <laughs> I dust them off and I bring them. And they're the classic old stuff. There's a uh, Watrim Brothers used to be at there, and they had all these old 50s, 60s uh, paperbacks and things like that. So people uh, were digging through those. And I, I told them, I, I said, you know, if you really want to just wholesale, get rid of all your books, we'll bring them next year. Uh, even there was even some that, uh, oh, geez, I can't find them. Oh, here they are. I got a pile of them here that I, I looked up. And some of them I wanted to keep and uh, look up. But other ones I, I discovered actually have uh, a bit of a value. I mean, and there, there's titles like Darkness in the Dawn by Thomas B. Constant, Third Man on the Mountain by James Ramsey Ullman, A uh, Handful of Hell, which is uh, 26 taunt and amazing tales of exciting adventure selected by a special board of editors from America's leading men's magazine. Ooh, men's magazine. I know. And then uh, there's a like couple the other ones. Like the one that you bought at, uh, at Steve Brown's shop? Yeah. Yeah, oh. exactly. And then uh, <clears throat> apparently there was a movie, which I've never heard of, The Last Picture Show, where a yes. boy, Sonny, learned to be a man with the wife of his football coach. Uh, uh, and then I, I also picked up one. Directed by Peter Bogdanovich. You probably have never heard of this cat, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, he did a book called Glide Path, and it's got a little Dell in the corner because it's uh, back when Dell was publishing paperbacks as well. Yes, so that's just kind of they fun. were mostly a magazine uh, company, and they actually, I think the last thing, they still kind of exist, except they got bought up by a company called Penny Press. So when you go and you look at all the uh, puzzle magazines, you'll see some that say Dell, but uh, Dell got bought by Penny Press, so they still publish magazines. This one was uh, 1965. So just kind of fun to, to see that type of stuff. Uh, one of my my buddy, my buddy I was talking about earlier that wasn't good with knickknacks or patty wax donated something called uh, Tonka Adventure Trucks. Now, why he bought these to begin with, I don't know. I think somebody might have talked him into it and told him that uh, these would be a great investment. Uh, unfortunately, no. 
And uh, I, before I, I sold them, I looked on eBay's and there was like nothing, no heat on them at all. And uh, towards the, the end, we, we decided to have a little fun like we want to do. And I would call a parent over with a kid and i say, is, you, is your child behaving today? I said, now, if you say yes, and it's up to you because it's going to be in your house, not mine, you can let him have one of these toys. And, of course, the kids, you know, they, they range from, like, smaller Hot Wheel toys to this huge three-foot, like, mega truck. And I got to give one kid kudos. Most of the kids would just grab the first thing. But the one kid went down, and he saw the mega truck, and he picked it up, and he was like, oh, can I have that? And the dad's like, are you really? I said, yes. They, I, we just got to get them out of my basement and into yours. And we sat on it for a little bit, and uh, eventually uh, – they came back to, get, to pick it up. So we had fun giving away that stuff. So the second day, I, I don't know how much more we made. At the end of the con, we just shoved everything in an envelope and uh, gave it to the, the charity guys. And uh, they put it in the safe and they'll, they'll, they figure it up later. So a lot of fun. Uh, didn't really spend, well, okay, I did spend a lot. One of the things uh, Corey and I were, were going, going to try to do this weekend was, uh, you know, Memorial Day weekend, a lot of people doing sales, a lot of uh, I think half price is doing a sale, things like that. But I had to kind of bow out, uh, and and it actually worked out okay because uh, uh, I just I, I I don't have a lot of money. I I, I blew a lot. I have so, a question about that, Joe. Uh, okay. you, you you were going to uh, nail nail a letter to Butch's door, letting him know that we were going out yesterday. Uh, Did he show up at your house? No. Nope. Um, and then you know, walk he might away have. with the sad Charlie Brown music playing when he found out we weren't going. He might have. It's hard to say. Uh, I do. I do have to say that uh, although you are, and these are air quotes, retired from uh, Comic Cons, you will be joining us next year. And you know why? Why? Because Angel Medina, who I owe an apology to, we. We all went out. We didn't go to the the steak dinner that the MCBA puts on for dealers and creators, uh, but we did go out to dinner. And when I got there, I was running late because I, you know, I always hang around and uh, make sure everything's secure at that con and try to get some last minute sales. And when we got to uh, where we went, uh, I was like, "Well, where's Angel? Oh, nobody thought to ask him." And Poor Angel's sitting at the con wondering where everybody went because one of the things he looks forward to is, you know, sitting down and talking comic books. Uh, but we've also come to the conclusion that we're um, as generous as the MCBA's offer is, we're probably not going to uh, do it. I think this is the second year Pat and I have just kind of struck out and gone somewhere. Well, we decided next year you're going to join us because Angel requests it. <laughs> and what we'll do is we'll let you know. Uh, in advance where we're going and you can just meet us and have dinner with us and we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, Angel was even wondering because he's, he's saying, you know, everything he everybody's getting older, you know, because he he got back to the hotel and he, he went to the room and he he did some drawings and some stuff that he, he had promised and things like that. When he went down to the party at by 11 o'clock, it was there was nobody there. It was done. Everybody's going to sleep. We're all getting older. No. <sighs> So, anyways, we'll keep you. We'll we'll let you know when that comes around. So just mark it on your calendar. They don't even have a spring con figured out yet, but uh, you can probably probably guess. It's usually that third week in in May, anyways. Now, I like I said, I, I did blow a lot of money. Uh, usually the first day, I uh, I go to Greg Hammer, one of the dealers there, because he always puts on such. I, I don't know. He, he's just one of those uh, weekend warrior guys, always getting new stuff in. Uh, I can tell I'm getting older because I didn't want to get on my knees and, and dig through the dollar books, mostly because it was all newer stuff anyways. But I did go through his $2 books and found a real cool assortment of uh, just, you know, mostly some beat up Silver Age and some interesting uh, uh, Golden Age. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to find one here. I've got that. I haven't even got a chance to look at any of this because, uh, you know, it'll it'll come uh, apparent. Well, some of it uh, we we've talked about in the past. I mean, uh, you remember Corey, the Untold Legend of the Batman? The, uh, yes. Do you remember? Uh, that was a three part mini series by uh, Len Wein and drawn by John Byrne when he was still working at Marvel. I think it was like eighty one. So yeah. he was uh, still. I, 
I think he was still on the X-Men at the time. This was the... Also uh, a time when Batman was not selling worth shit. Well, this, was, uh, this was actually from the Batman brand sweetened cereal. Because what you could do is get an undersized uh, format that you mailed away for, and they mailed you the three issues. And uh, I, I don't know who did the brand. So it was kind of like a Captain Crunch type thing. So this is around Michael Keaton Batman. So it might have been also, uh, you know, people were starting to pick up on uh, on Batman just because of the movie. And uh, but the weird thing is the number one issue is says a special MPI auto edition. So I thought I was getting a set, the Batman sweet and cereal, but but it the uh, and I, it is a set. I mean, it's three issues. But the uh, the number one is is something I've never seen. I picked up a Detective Comics number one, the uh, the, the the Millennial edition, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't 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 want you to think of you know that's why I'm broke. Uh, but I, I picked up all sorts of things, and and some of it was uh, you know heroes versus Hitler. They're back. The the Eye, Alter, Captain Ego, the Human Cat, the Eclipse, Lady Scorpion. You know. Uh, some of them I don't know why I picked up. Uh, like uh, I think this is Gloria, Angela, uh, Rob Liefeld, and the uh, the the extreme. Oh, how would you say the well, way he draws women? You know, obviously no room for backbones or reproductive organs or anything like that. Uh, some of it was just because it was just fun. I mean, a Gold Digger color remix four issue series. I figured I, I've never read Gold Digger. Uh, it's from uh, Antarctic Press, I believe, and uh, they've been printing for a long time. I mean, at the time this came out, there was 15 years, and they're still going strong, I think, in previews. I'd have to look it up. Uh, some of it, again, same thing, Fem Force, if you remember them. Uh, yep. A couple couple titles there. But every so often, you, you run across something that just really, you're like, what, what, what? And, and I know I'm going to say this wrong, but uh, it's called The Masked potato and it's it's obviously a uh, uh an independent book that somebody might have done at one of our cons i gotta open this sucker up it's two issues i found from 1993 and it's it's got like card cover and just it looks like it looks like a oversized uh how would you call it mini comic and I, we laughed about it all weekend the masked potato. We kept calling it the mash potato. It's like, okay, we got the pun. So I'll be, uh, I, I don't even see any creator credits on this thing. So uh, if you own the masked potato, give us a call. We'd love to hear from them. Uh, and I'll be reading it, obviously, in the next couple of weeks. And well, maybe It'll one of our spud boy. It'll come up. I might as well face it. I'm, I'm addicted to spuds. So I didn't have much luck uh, filling in. Uh, my uh, missing comics. I, I actually I emailed Corey while I was uh, doing it because I went through my whole comic collection and I I was filling in the gaps, trying to figure out what I was missing, including my uh, not finished yet uh, Ultraverse collection. I talked a lot about it at the beginning of a podcast, and I think I might be too late because I did not see any. Ultraverse stuff. I think it's all cycled through because, uh, you know, you figure you might find them in the dollar books. You might find them in the cheap stuff. But I did not find anything much to my chagrin, not even any variants. Usually I find stuff like that. Uh, so I'm a little little perturbed on that. Uh, I did find one essential. Pat Gruber brought a bunch of essentials and I was able to get a Daredevil volume three. So one more of that collection down. On some of the fun things I bought, I actually got, Corey, I got a, a Midnight Frights film called Remission, Death Awaits. And I got this for you because I'm not sure if you uh, if you like it. It says in the back, the Reverend Joseph has lost everything. Now he must face the choices he has made in the name of survival. He encounters a group of people who may restore his faith and heal his soul, but their leader threatens to destroy them all. Will good win out, or will evil that lurks around the corner consume them? Hmm. So, and it's autographed, too. So, oh, got, wow. Uh, some other weird things I picked up uh, from uh, Michael May and Jason Copeland, who were, were across from us the entire time. I picked up the Omnibus Kill All Monsters, 
Monsters rule the world. Humanity's last hope is a squad of giant robots and their skilled pilots, all from different backgrounds, each with a unique reason to fight. Can we survive the conflict? Are we worthy? Uh, this is basically an omnibus featuring hundreds of pages. The complete the ruins of Paris for the first time. It also collects the Ministry of Robots from Dark Horse Presents and a, uh, a unique thing, Island of Giants. This is a, a Dark Horse publication, by the way, so you may have seen it already. And I just told uh, me, I said, yeah, 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 you wore me down. I stared at it all weekend. I had to buy it. Uh, from our old pal of the show, uh, Terrence Greep, he was there. He had uh, a comic I'd never seen before that The Adventures of Chrissy Claus. And uh, while it's not as much fun as his other appearance as Spider Baby, what was interesting about this, and we will, we will play and does the Strode know? This actually contains a reprint of Terrence Greep's first comic book work. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the, uh, the answer here because, uh, you know me, if I don't write it down, I just, I just will forget. But Mr. Strode, do you know his first uh, comic book? I do not. Um, I remember him showing up at a convention real early in the 90s. And he uh, spent most of his time chatting about how he was going to think up a fake British name to get a job with Vertigo. Yeah, <laughs> and um, remember at the ta- at the uh, ticket table there was that TV. We're talking back at the old Thunderbird. There was a oh, TV yeah, yeah. up there. Yeah, and uh, one of the artists wanted to watch the football game, and he said he would move his table out to the ticket table if we could turn it to the football game, and we couldn't figure out how to do it. Terrence actually climbed up. Uh, he took a chair and then uh, put the chair on the railing and then climbed up and changed the channel on the hotel TV. <laughs> but I don't remember his first comic. I thought it was Scooby-Doo. Nope. He, uh, let me find it here. Flare first edition number five. Oh. And this, the book I got, The Adventures of Chrissy Claus from June 2006, reprints his first uh, work. The Divine Intervention. So, uh, first of all, it's got a Christmas cover, which I do love. I, I like uh, around Christmas time co- decorating the house with some uh, Christmassy comics. Obviously, not bizarre adventures, but uh, you know some other things. And uh, then, of course, just if he, it's his first work, I thought it was kind of neat, and I like supporting uh, the local guys, which is why I picked up a copy from Zompastic First issue. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. This is from Fards Comic Groups, F-A-R-Z. They clean up evil one wipe at a time. No, I'm not talking about the cleaner. I'm talking about Poop Man and Corn Boy. Attack oh, the God. zombie turds. Oh, and I, I went by and I told the guy, oh, you had me at poop. I mean, I just, uh, it's a flip book on the other side, the Cyberpunk 3000, a punk rock superhero for the cosmic age. So, it was kind of neat. They both uh, autographed it, which is always fun to, to meet the guys and to have them actually autograph their work. Again, with along with the masked potato, I'm sure this will show up in a future review and let people know. Uh, under the uh, category of OK, that is a very cool title. I don't want you to think I'm getting highfalutin, even though it is a John Steinbeck novel. I don't think you could get highfalutin after talking about a comic about poop. Well, yeah, because the title of this uh, Steinbeck novel is Never Flirt with Puppy Killers and Other Better Book Titles. So, uh, it's a book for people who do not have thousands of hours to read book reviews or blurbs or first sentences. (laughs) So, that's perfect for me. As it was fun. Now, the coolest thing I got, well, that's not that true. I will will mention the omnibus I picked up, but uh, George Hagenauer... The man who created the art auction. Hagenauer came over and asked me if I bought the Captain Marvel Adventures Golden Age from him a couple years ago where Captain Marvel visited Minneapolis. And I know I talked about this on the podcast. I talked about it twice. First about getting it because he not only visited the mayor, but he also jumped over the Fauché Tower, which at the time was the tallest building in Minneapolis. But it was a very, very nice comic. I mean, in terms of condition. And I end up selling it on the Ebays just because I'm like, you know what? I don't need a $300 comic. I just 
he did 300 bucks. But this one, Captain Marvel visits St. Paul, Minnesota. And it's not as in great a shape. It was only about 25 bucks, whereas the other one, like I said, was upwards of 300 I haven't looked at it. I can tell it's got water damage uh, and kind of wrinkly, but it is complete, and I should be able to read it. So that was kind of cool. I thought that was kind of a neat uh, local thing. Because, you know, I live in St. Paul, and I kind of like that. He didn't visit Chaska because I don't think Chaska was around when he came around. But uh, George was explaining to me how apparently they went on a year tour going across the United States, visiting all different towns. And I thought, well, that's probably why they ended up selling 5 million copies a month because of that type of local interest. And I mentioned an omnibus from our good man, Steve Brown, man about town, who's never, never without a frown. He had World War Hulk omnibus. Ooh. And he How had much sell it up for? Uh, he gave it to me for 70. This was part of the deal where you talked about, I think, where Marvel – isn't liquidating, but they put a better discount on their omnibuses. And Steve picked up some. He said he was not impressed with the omnibuses offered, nor was he impressed with the price. But he picked up a few so he could, uh, you know, offer them. And this one I, I looked at, I looked at, and then I went back and just bought it because it's one that's been on my list. Uh, the price he gave it to me was actually fairly decent. And uh, so I was pretty excited about that. Uh, at the art auction, I mentioned before, I bought something that I don't even know if you've seen before. Now, you you, you know about Detective Comics 1000, right? Yes. Dan Jurgens donated a Detective Comics 1000 press kit. It's oh, a wow. black box. And at the time, he did not know, but you open it up, and it has a copy of uh, Detective Comics 1000. It's the Jim Lee copies, but it's not unique to... The, bo the box. He was. He thought it might have been, but he wasn't sure. I compared it because that was the cover I bought. Uh, but it also has two uh, glasses, a, a little wine bottle that says Detective Comics 1000 on it, all inside uh, like protective stuffing. It's plastic and it's probably apple juice because DC is not allowed to mail uh, alcohol. And it does come with a certificate of authenticity that basically talks about when Detective Comics 27 debuted in, debuted in March 1939, DC changed the landscape of superhero storytelling forever. Armed with nothing more than his wits, his will, and a promise made to his dead parents, Gotham City millionaire Bruce Wayne donned the cape and cowl, embarking on his one-man war against crime and injustice. It goes on for quite a bit, talking about that. And then, of course, it's Batman's 80th anniversary. It says, we'd like to invite you to join the celebration of a unique achievement and uh, toast the Caped Crusaders 1,000th issue on social media. And then, of course, it talks about go here for details, blah, blah, blah. And Dan said he was offered quite a bit of money for this when he first got it. And uh, I know Dan doesn't really collect these things as much. Uh, we've talked in the past, you know, some of the things he gets comped, he's not even sure what to do with. And I keep telling him, just bring it to the con. You know, he did that with all the Death of Superman Platinums he had, and he sold out of them. You know, but that's not how Dan makes his money. He makes his money, you know, writing and drawing comics. So he's not really real keen on, on selling stuff like that. But he donated it. I went to Ape Shit. I bought it. And, uh, I, I'm really not sure what I'm going to do with it. I, I might just put it back on the Ebays because uh, it was the heat of the moment, which is really my problem when I get to the art auction. It was the heat of the moment. Crowds were really good at the con. Uh, it was a little rainy, but uh, it didn't seem to affect anybody coming in, the good, good moods. And uh, I think everybody had a decent time. I didn't. A lot of people sold quite a bit. Uh, we had donations at the art auction up to the last minute, even to the charity booth at the last minute. And uh, some people asked about leaving things. And uh, I said, you know, if you don't, if you can't leave it now, get a hold of me somehow, because I'll start uh, gathering stuff up. Uh, now, that was, uh, I, I took two weeks off of work, unlike Corey, you know, who, you know, gets an entire month off. <sighs> Fun, isn't it? Art, it's art, amazing, and we will talk about it later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so the con hit. Everything went back. We 
uh, with the help of uh, all the kids in their cars, we basically we brought out like about five, maybe six loads of stuff, came back with three. So we blew out a lot of stuff. Uh, we dumped it in our garage because the next day, my wife and I went north to uh, two harbors because it was our anniversary. And Corey, I, I don't know if Corey knows. Do you know the year of our, how many years my sainted wife has been married to me? Yes, because you mentioned it last episode. You're darn 31. right. Yeah. I, am, I am incredibly blessed, proud, and impressed that any woman would want to be with me 31 seconds, much less 31 years. Uh, she either has me cowed in ways that I don't know, or I just am way too in love to uh, to care. But uh, we, we unfortunately, because of my hip surgery, I don't have a lot of time. Matter of fact, I am back to zero in terms of vacation time because I burn it all doing the con and doing the the uh, going up north. We just went for a couple days, uh, hit two harbors, walked all over Split Rock, uh, hit Betty's Pies, of course, can't miss that. And uh, we had a good time. If for just being gone two days, it really felt good just to, to get out of there. And uh, when I got home, of course, had to go back to work. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more of that when I get to freaking. But I, I really, I, I got depressed. You know, I mean, I had a great time. It was fun. I did the two things I love most in life. I got to hang with my comic book friends and geek all weekend. And then I got to hang with my wife and then we got to go to the North shore and to come back to reality. It, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And, and I know you'll probably get that too, Corey, as you start winding up and getting ready to go back to work. Cause you're like, I don't want to go back. <sighs> so as soon as we're done podcasting, that is, uh, I got to go out to the garage and try to reassemble it because not only uh, I got tons of things to go through, I got to get it kind of stored because a lot of times I get to it and it's like, okay, I thought I had it stored, but it didn't. It was full of dust and, you know, just wipe it off. And we actually joked at it at the art or the uh, charity booth. Like, why is it so dusty? It's, oh, it's a warehouse. Fine. Some guy just brought it from a warehouse. Boom. Uh, but I'm finding things out there that are just a blast. Uh, I found a copy of uh, a signed picture from the ultimate warrior back when he Ooh. appeared, I believe was at the comage, the uh, image tent here. He was pushing the warrior book. Yes. Which is um, exceedingly weird. Yes. What's even better is there's a polar to me leaning over the table, shaking hands with him. And I'm like, wow. I, I remember when we were in line because I had three things I wanted him to sign. I wanted him to sign a Warrior comic. I wanted him to sign a notebook that we had started putting jams in. We just had people put anything they want, you know, some guy. And I don't even know where the notebook is. I think my daughters have it. And uh, I wanted him to sign an autograph photo. And then while we were getting up there, all of a sudden they made an announcement. He's only going to sign two items. And you're like, oh, you rat bastard. We're like two people in line. We've been sitting there for an hour. So I, I made a, got the picture and I got the comic. The comic I might still have. I've got to go through all my old wrestling comics and see what I have. But it was so cool to find the picture and uh, just be reminded of that that whole uh, weekend, which was a blast. So who knows? I might have some more stuff as a, as I dig through the garage and uh, try to actually it's a three places. I got to reassemble my eBay's because I got a lot of fun stuff that's going up. I've got to reassemble the garage and then of course the basement because pretty much. Everything that was down there is is has been brought up. I will say one thing though: if any of you out there in podcasting land is at remotely interested in a hand solo on a tauntaun, we're talking the big twelve-inch one. Let me know because we've had one for three years. Nobody wants it. I mean, the thing goes for one hundred fifty bucks on eBay, and that's before you tax shipping on. And I could not give that sucker away. So if somebody out there is interested, it's in nice shape. I'll box it up nice. If you donate any money, it'll go to the, I'll just give it right to the con guys to give to comic book legal defense fund or whatever. So, but that was the biggest piece left over. Everything else went and uh, a good time was had by all. How was your week? It was okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have too much fun. <laughs> It was okay. Oh, let's see. How long did Joe go? Uh, did, 
Joe always says, you drop a quarter in me and I'll go. I, I dropped a quarter in Joe. He went for 37 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, damn straight. And the best thing was is people minutes. paid with like $2 bills and 50 cent pieces. And it's all sorts of weird coinage. So, yeah, I, I was ready to go. You know it's going to be a, an all-me podcast after a con, especially since uh, you retired from them. I got, I got to let the people know what a great time it is had by all so that when fall con comes around, you know, at uh, – October fifth, two thousand nineteen, ten a.m. to six p.m. Uh, you all, you all come down and, and have some fun. So it'll all be updated. Y'all come it's down, okay. you hear? Yeah, here. MCBA Comic Cons dot com. Uh, if you go to the website, or I'm sorry, the fate. Well, the website's probably in stasis now because believe me, they're all in Odin's sleep. Uh, but if you go to the Facebook page, a lot of pictures posted, get an idea what was going on, and. Uh, it's it's pretty pretty sweet. You also see a a picture. There's a video uh, put up by Anthony of a uh, cosplayer who, uh, uh, if, if you go watch her video, she's a very attractive woman. A lot of cool photos that she had in various comic book poses and stuff. And when I get my one from Pat, I'll, maybe I'll talk about it next year or our next podcast. I'll, I'll explain how Pat roped me into buying one from her. Oh, that wouldn't be hard. Oh uh, well, you know, I only collect the Supergirl thing. But Pat had a de- she had a deal. If you buy two, you get one free. And Pat knew which Ooh. free one he wanted. Uh, he had already bought one from her. And see, you put another quarter in me. And so what happened was, and I'm going to uh, open the link here and try to figure out the the uh, the uh, model's name. Ah, uh, come on! How could you have her up there and not really have her name? Oh, well, I'll find it out next year. But anyway, she had a, a, a photo of her as Power Girl, but she was just wearing the cape covering the multi bits and the gloves. She didn't and have I, the boob window? Oh, trust me. She had no problem with that. But she, the way she was posing, it was uh, as she uh, – I told her, I said, now, if you autograph this to, yes, to me as, yes, I'm, I'm Super Girl – I'll buy one because I only buy su- I like Supergirl stuff and you know Power Girl blah 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 whatever and she was a good sport about it so uh, so but what you know it's driving me crazy because I don't have her name I'm going to go figure that out while you uh, regale us about what you did the weekend of the con and in subsequent time actually the weekend of the con I got uh, kind of uh, well. I'll get really deep into it in freaking and geeking, but uh, worked a lot over that weekend. And then uh, this week, I did not have to work all that much. I did have uh, sleep shifts and such, but I uh, did a lot of reading. I read um, Invasion from Planet Russeltopia, which is coming out from Starburns Comics. The first issue is already out. And, well, I just I recorded an entire review of it right here. As both a pro wrestling fan and a comic book fan, I was excited to read Invasion from Planet Russeltopia. I was sent the first two issues, and I have to say, this was an excellent comic. It is set in a world where pro wrestling is, much like it is here, a show. However, it's a science fiction book in that it is set in the late 80s when the signal of a pro wrestling show where the uh, professional wrestler says that he is the intergalactic champion of wrestling gets picked up on a distant world and the uh, champion of that world comes to Earth. There are a lot of ways in which this book could have gone wrong. However, because it treats the lead character with compassion and makes him a more complex character than you would imagine, it really works. It treats the world of professional wrestling like it is, a show. Um, The lead character is asked to do something he doesn't want to do. He pays the price for um, his actions, and yet we then get this science fiction twist of the um, alien who takes his promo for real. I know that that all sounds odd, but if you're a pro wrestling fan, you understand. Yeah, the wrestler gives a promo where he talks about not only how he's going to beat his opponent, but how he is the best ever. Well, what if an alien race that gets involved in uh, wrestling believes it? 
this book would not work if not for the amazing art. Um, artist Dan Shack, S-C-H-K-A-D-E. I've not seen his work before. He draws this almost like an animated cell. It's um, a perfect choice for a story that straddles the line between humor and, and science fiction so closely. Um, it's hard to describe how much I enjoyed this book because it takes all of the prof professional wrestling stuff, all of the little quirks behind the scenes, all the little odd things about it. The lead character is someone that you empathize with pretty rapidly and then throws him into this science fiction situation and takes it all seriously. It's not treated like a goof, even though it's inherently a silly idea. And in a lot of ways, that's the only way a book like this could work. If it was over the top, it wouldn't have worked. If it treated wrestling the way most comics do, where you know, the, the world of pro wrestling is, quote, real, unquote. Nope, they treat it like it is in our world, just a show. And the people involved are performers. It, it felt a lot like Galaxy Quest in a lot of ways, with that same feel that where there's humor involved in the situation, but because you care about the characters, there's an actual story and pathos involved. Um, the first two issues should be out by now, and I cannot wait for the third issue. I'm so excited and so happy that I got this book. Um, our review scale is a buy, borrow, ignore. This is a buy. And this is one where once the trade paperback is out, I'm going to be buying this because I know I'm going to be reading it more than once. See how I like drop it in the uh, the pre-records, Joe? I also right. read a 100-page special that came out about a, oh, two months ago. Um, Man and Superman, by Marv, written by Marv Wolfman. And what it is, it's a, a four-part story that he did for the No Longer With Us Superman Confidential which was kind of a, well, DC had a Batman Confidential, Superman Confidential, and Justice League Confidential. And they were series where they would go get creative teams to say, hey, put together your best story featuring these characters, be it a one, two, three, or four part story. And it was a series. And one of the problems I have with American comics is, anthologies do not sell and I love anthologies um, one of the things that I've been watching a lot while I've been out um, on recovery are anthologies on Netflix Black Mirror um, older anthologies Thriller the Boris Karloff series um, Twilight Zone new old and oldest <laughs> There have been three Twilight Zone series, Joe. I know. And um, I enjoy those. So this was set for that Superman anthology. And in the opening, Marv Wolfman says this. He believes it's the best Superman story he ever wrote. And I don't know as I would go that far because he was involved in Superman right after Man of Steel. He's the man who kind of created the Luther as a businessman. But what this is, this is the story of when Clark Kent gets to Metropolis and before he becomes Superman. And one of the things as I'm reading it, first I read it for the sheer enjoyment and then I read it to do a review of it. Because it's nine ninety nine, but it's a hundred page comic. Really, it's a trade paperback reprinting the four issues that were never printed in the first place. So it's kind of a cheap trade paperback. And it reminded me, first off, how much I love Marv Wolfman's storytelling. And second, it's the construction. It's a four-part story, but each part is a story in and of itself. Each issue has a beginning, middle, and end. Yes, there are things that feed into so that all four parts make a complete story, but Marv Wolfman is one of those writers. He started writing back in the six, 
late 60s and 70s, when each issue kind of had to live on its own. And Joe and I have talked a lot in the past about how when we would buy comics, there were times I would flip to the back page, not to spoil it, but to see if it was continued. Yeah. Yeah, Because if it was continued, I may not be able to get the next part. And Wolfman was very good at, even if a story was continued, you felt like you got a whole story in that one issue. And the other thing is that while he's using that older storytelling type, it didn't feel like I'm reading an old story. Because when I read a 70s story, the the tricks they use really jump out at me. You know, where the character on the second page isn't really doing much other than being buried by thought balloons to fill us in on everything that's gone on in the last few issues. But they don't do that anymore, thank God. Because they have um, the title page, which says, you know, here's what's been happening. So it's a great Superman story. It's a story, however, that's been told over and over and over and over. So it really doesn't fit in continuity. This is more, okay, here's Marv Wolfman's version of what happened when Superman got to Metropolis. And a lot of people have done those stories. There have been better ones. But there have not been better Superman stories by Marv Wolfman. So um, the art was very much in that, I would say, early 2000s style where you know, the characters were drawn very big. Um, they took up a lot of page. But the thing that jumped out at me, it's um, Claudio Castiglia, who I thought, oh, wow, that's uh, a... Ca- that, that's a wrestler from uh, Ring of Honor. No, 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 no. But uh, his poses for people were odd. People seemed like they were kind of off balance a lot of the time. And I don't know if that's something where he was just learning how to draw or what. But every so often I would look at a pose by Lois Lane and go, she's about to fall down. And it actually took me out of the story. But overall, I thought that was a really good comic. Um, I finished the Destiny trilogy for Star Trek novels, which is how um, the Federation defeated the Borg. What did you think of that? The first book struck me as fan fiction. I was reading it, rolling my eyes. The second book was a lot better in that it shoved all of that fan fiction-y stuff to the side and got into the the plot. The problem is, Joe, you've read all three of them, right? Oh, yeah. I raved about them when they came out. Okay. You know how they, they ended the story, how they defeated the Borg? Yeah. I figured that out in the middle of the second novel. I wasn't – I was too enthralled in it. I guess I, for me, the big thing was – and. and I've talked about this in a fan fiction-y way. You know, you think about all the defeats the Borg had by just a single Federation ship. And and the gist of the thing is, okay, the Borg have given up. They're not assimilating. They're destroying. 7,000 yeah. Borg cubes show up. And it's kind of neat because it it has ramifications beyond the books if you keep reading it, uh, the, the series of books, because now – they deal very well with the federations now recovering from this war, you know, and there are major planets that got destroyed. uh, And it it gets into the Tyson pact books and novels and, uh, uh, you know, basically the powers that surround the federation suddenly decide, Hey, this might be a good time to try to counterbalance the federation. Um, That's coming in the future. Yeah, Uh, as far as, well, and it also, it deals with the Voyager books, which I I lost track on because the Federation doesn't, they they know what sort of happened at the end. And again, I don't know if you want to just toss up a spoiler on this because, I mean, the book's, what, five years old, more than that? Uh, You know, the the group, I'm not even going to try to describe it, but basically the group that was responsible for the Borg wasn't the Borg themselves. But they came and they basically took the Borg and left. And the reason why they they 
never did that before because they were what? What's the word? Xenophobic. They, yeah. They just didn't get involved with things. And then you know, of course, they they figured out how to do it. And there's a lot of other stuff that happens, like you know, why didn't uh, Seven of Nine get taken? You know, she doesn't know about that. Did the is the Borg really gone? Uh, you know, again, we're, we could call this the Star Trek Extended Universe because none of it happened now with the new Picard show coming up. But as a, a series of books, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was a neat war book. I could have done more. You know, we always laugh at comic books where, uh, you know, okay, the main event, War of Realms, and then they have a bunch of tie-ins. They could have done a bunch of tie-in books. Uh, they refer to a lot of things like uh, the uh, Star Trek, uh, Starfleet Corps of Engineers saved the planet by making it disappear. You know, that that's what it passes. And I think there's a short story somewhere that covers that. Probably. Uh, um, I think I read it somewhere. But, you know, they could have made more of an event out of it than they did. And uh, what's, like I say it wrong, what's the word, ex machina? Ex machina. Thank you, machina. It kind of, the ending kind of smacked of that, too. Because the Federation never really defeated the Borg. Right. That's what I was going to say. In the middle of the second book, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, I know how the, I know what's going to happen here. The problem I had with it, in the third book, they give the origin of the Borg, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work based on this TV series, and it doesn't work based on other novels, but it really doesn't work in that we have been told in the TV series, in the movies, etc., that the Borg have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. No, they've only been around 6,000 years. And that really, I wanted to call the author and go, can, can you can you, can you, you please just go back and watch the, the first episode where they appear and Q says that they've been around for hundreds of thousands of years and just correct that? Could you do yeah. that, please? Yeah, just one can, little, can, can one you, little fix toy. that? Or do what they do in the Trek magazine. Explain why it isn't wrong. Maybe Q's right, but not they weren't a threat until 6,000 years ago. Maybe they weren't. You know, I mean, how long have humans been around? Longer than we have history, but yeah. we're probably not recognizable in our very early form. Oh, well, actually, Q got that wrong, too, in the all good things anyways, but not, never mind. Maybe Q's not the best source to go with. <laughs> but yeah, it's just little things like that, especially when you're making a book series that's designed for mega fans, not casual fans like the original. We talked about this years ago when Trek novels used to just be standalone stories that had nothing to do with anything else. And then when it became apparent they were never going to go back and visit it, they started making them interconnected, much like Star Wars books. Which also makes them impenetrable to people who, yeah, hey, just think I'll pick this up and read it. Exactly. That was that's been my problem with the Star Trek books for a while. If you go to the original series books, yep, they stand on their own. The thing I like about I I love Star Trek Discovery. I know that there are people who don't. They're wrong. Um, those books stand on their own. The comics, for the most part, stand on their own. But the books around um, Next Generation and that timeline, you know, I, I sent you the list. It's so convoluted. And I even got, okay, what do I read next? Okay, there are these six novels that come next in the timeline. Ugh. Fine, I'm just going to go read something else. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I was reading them as they came out. So right. when I got to a bookstore, and again, I, I, maybe there was somewhere it said, okay, this is what's coming out. But I had to compare the publication dates. And yeah. if I saw, okay, this is the next one in the sequence. And I got to admit, when I read these books, I enjoyed the living heck out of them. Um, if there was a definitive list where you could do it, I would still say stick with them because most of the time these Star Trek books are really cheap anyways. Yeah. But again, I don't read Star Wars books for the same reason because it's impenetrable to me. 
you know, everyone opens up with, okay, here's where it happens in the timeline gauged upon the fight at Yarvin. And I just, uh, I just wish that they would do that with the Star Trek books. Cause I was at a used bookstore and I picked one up and it didn't say, you know, you need to read these first. It was, it just opened. Well, sometimes they say this happened before the events and this, yeah. I or they'll started. give a, they'll give a year and it's like, well, I don't know what that means. Exactly. I mean, I have a few books I bought. Start date, blah, 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 blah. Great, thanks. I read it, and then I realized, oh, i got to read a book before this. Yes. And then what's worse is I find out, oh, I did read that book already, and I donated it to the charity booth and got rid of it. And I imagine that's what people feel when they pick up a comic, and it's, well, this is an alternate timeline, or this is a parallel Earth. You should hear my movie friends of the Marvel Universe going nuts over the concept of a multiverse. They really, it's like this is a brand new concept to them. And yeah, the first topic, I, I, I do want to point out, you know, because they're bringing it up because of the um, the Spider-Man Far From Home trailer. Yeah. Who's telling you that he comes from another parallel Earth? I have yet to see it, but go ahead and tell. Mysterio. Those of us who are comic friends, when we hear Mysterio says, we know, well, everything he says is a lie. <laughs> well, except in the Spider-Man miniseries, you know, because that's a, maybe they're trying to base it off that. You know, where Peter Parker and Miles Morales met back when there was they, the universes were still separate. I actually like the idea. What you do is you take you get Tobey Maguire, uh, Andy. Uh, oh, what's his name? Andrew Garfield. Garfield. Thank you. Uh, the current, the current guy. Even go back to the seventies guy, Nick. I can't remember his name. There's Nicholas your Hammond. There's your and, and we even talked about the. Uh, you, you could get the electric company guy who never talks but just whoop, word balloons appear and animate a, a a spider ham. You know, there's your there's your live movie. If you're gonna do it, do it right. You know, bring these old things in. Plus, then you tie in some of the old stuff. I still tell people, yeah, you got to Howard deducts part of continuity now. You got to go back to 83 and, and watch that movie. <laughs> Sorry. 85, but no, Truth. 86. Truth hurts. Yeah. We're all excited. George had us. George, uh, George Lucas is doing it. It's got to be good. Oh, Leah Thompson's in it. Um, I also binge watched some TV. Um, but mostly comic wise, I just read a lot of current stuff. I got caught up on. Um, Daredevil, Chip Zdarsky's knocking it out of the park. Um, War of the Realms is very, very cool. Um, I'm also reading Harry Turtle Dove. I he does a lot of what they call alternate history novels, and his first alternate history of the Civil War, where the South won, was a science fiction time travelly thing where white supremacists came back in time and gave Robert E. Lee uh, modern weapons. And that was the um, Guns of the South, which he did in 92. But in 97, he did a, a novel called How Few Remain. And that's the one I'm reading now, which is, it's just pure alternate history. There's no uh, science fiction elements to it. And I think there's a, series that um, HBO is talking about that people are up in arms about, which is an alternate history where the South won the Civil War. And people are calling it white supremacist porn, et cetera, et cetera. I, to me, I've read alternate history novels since I've been reading novels. Um, actually, one of my favorite comics of the 80s was Captain Confederacy by Will Shetterly, who lived right here in Minneapolis. And it's about a superhero in a world where the South won the Civil War. And Captain Confederacy is their Captain America. And he's starting to question the, um, the Confederates' way of life. And it's just a brilliant, brilliant comic. Um, they did 12 issues through Steel Dragon Press, then they did a few issues with um, Epic, and then it just kind of ended because Will Shetterly could make more money doing novels than he could doing comics at the time, I guess. But um, 
I'm about halfway through this book. Then there are what two? There's a three book. There are eleven books altogether, and you know then the next series is um, what would have happened with World War One, and the one after that's what would have happened with World War Two. So, um, I've been just um, enjoying the fact that I've had all this time. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of a gift. I never would have had this much time off any other way than getting the surgery. <laughs> yeah, I, I know and the I, feeling. And, you know, you talked about how you got depressed going back to work. For me, it's not a depression. It's okay. I need to get better at planning things so that I'm not rushing around all the time. And we'll talk about that a little later on. You know who's not rushing around all the time, Joe? Well, I will tell you, it's not Kristen Laney. She's the model I was talking about earlier, and you can go on Facebook. I'll spell her last name, Kristen, L-A-N-A-E, and she's on uh, Facebook. She's on Twitter. She's got her own website. She's got a Patreon. Very nice woman, very beautiful woman. So if you want to see just uh, what enthralled Pat to drag me across the – the uh, uh, Con Florida to uh, to uh, get an extra picture. Uh, you can you can do that and let her know that uh, we sent you because maybe we'll maybe we'll get her on our this year podcast and interview her. It'd be kind of fun. But but what 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 Corey what? These guys, our sponsors. That's right. Here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network, we have ads, and our first sponsor is me. That's right. Your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. I have my first book out with Dangerous Dan Moore. It's the first hundred strips of our online web strip, Worldwide News, the story of the lowest rated cable news network. And you can get yourself a copy with commentary, with all sorts of extras, with uh, signatures and everything. Just email Dan over at lordshadowflame at gmail.com. Our top sponsor, who's been with us since day one, is DreamHost. DreamHost.com. You need yourself a website, and DreamHost.com is the number one web host in the whole known universe. Just head over to DreamHost.com, put in the code CRAZY, K-R-A-Y-Z, get $20 off your first year. How can you beat that? Our other sponsor is Graze, G-R-A-Z-E. Dot com healthy snacks for a healthy lifestyle just head over to Gray's put in the code c o r y s 3 r 5 p your first and fifth box are free you could get them weekly you could get a bi-weekly you could get a monthly you just order a whole bunch of them it's great stuff to keep you away from the vending machine at work now if you would like to leave a comment for any of the podcasts that we do, we'd love those. Go ahead and email us at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com, or you can call 952-856-0519. Operators are standing by. Okay, it's just a place that will record your calls, but we'll play them on the air. We'll answer your questions. We love getting feedback. Tell us what you think. Ask a question. Suggest a topic. Be a guest. Send us your stuff. Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. If you would like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose radio shows, you can. Just email us at Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. Subject advertising. Thanks. And um, I, I have all these other podcasts I do that we have the ads on, like these. The Solitaire Rose Radio Network has all sorts of podcasts for you. There's, of course, Crazy Comics and Stories, where myself and Crazy Joe Ryder get together once a week to talk comics. We review comics, we talk about upcoming comics, we talk about comics history, anything that has to do with comics, we're going to talk about. We also have Series and Review, where we review series and kind of give a DVD commentary of past comics that we've enjoyed. There is also Solitaire Rose Radio. Solitaire Rose Radio is my solo show where I discuss upcoming comics, past comics, comics history, and interview comics creators. These are all at crazycomics.solitairerose.com. There's also the podcast I'm proudest of. That's Novelcast, where I take the novels that I have written and turn them into audiobooks. That's at novels.solitairerose.com. Over at Bad Advice, myself, Dan Moore, and Wolfie B. Bad take your questions and give you 
bad advice. It's at badadvice.solitairerose.com. Now, don't think that I'm doing all the podcasts, because there's also Scrabbling Across the West by Dave Cofell and Stephanie Cofell. Dave is a musician, and Stephanie is his wife. They travel the country performing music and playing Scrabble over at scrabbling.solitairerose.com. And finally, the newest member of the Solitaire Rose Radio Group, that's Fantastic Forecast, where myself and host of For the Love of Comics, Adam Vermillion, go over the series The Fantastic Four, four issues at a time. That's available at fantasticforecast.solitairerose.com. If you would like to advertise on any of these podcasts, you can just email me at, at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com. Thanks. And now that we're done with my plugs, we get to Joe's favorite part of the show. No, 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 not where I give him a leftover uh, Lifesavers uh, holiday book. Aww. No, it's, uh, Joe, what's going on on the Ebays? Oh, all sorts of stuff. I I've, I had a couple couple uh, rough times going because there were, uh, you know, somebody didn't get their item and reported it. Uh missing you know they didn't contact me direct and then uh you know i'm like okay you didn't get it i'll I'll refund your money then got it he got it and of course never repaid me so you know you get you get thieves like that occasionally uh sometimes you go and you you know i I was going to sell something and it's not where it's supposed to be so i refund it say sorry i think i might uh i think i might have just donated it to the art auction uh did that in two cases and then in one case i was like oh i found it again just whatever brain farts so kind of rough but then you sit back and you realize you know you're gonna have those problems but then the sales start ripping in and you just look back at some of the cool things that sold uh, some of it we've talked about. swimsuit special number five it had a, a linsner dawn cover on it uh, uh wolverine complete collection volume three i bought this when uh the original mind's eye comic was going out of business and uh I just, you know, read it, sold it. Uh, Lay Death One Royal Blue Foil Variant Zero. Uh, apparently, there's a two that I didn't get, so, you know. DC Showcase Presents Wonder Woman Volumes 1 and 2. Uh, there's a book called Faithless Out from Boom with, uh, I can never pronounce the name, Brian Azariel. Azarello. Azarello and Maria Lovett. And they had a pre order erotic variant cover by Tula Lote. And uh, I, I and you can go find it now, but when it first came out, it was in a black cover, and I bought one, and uh, like I told you, you know, hey, sex sells, so ended up selling it on the Ebays. Some other odd things sold, uh, Dark Rain, The List, Hulk, number one, hero variant cover done by none other than Frank Choi, which was kind of cool. Uh, a, remember, I think Corey remembers, or does he know, Batman 686, Detective 853, what, what, what was so big about that? Uh, that was the Neil Gaiman issues. Yep, yep. Whatever happened to the Cape Crusader? Was that right before New Fifty Two, or was that just? It was. Bef- it was in the middle of uh, Final Crisis because Batman had died. Ah, so uh, let's see what other fun things. Oh, speaking of oddball books. Every so often, one thing that eBay is really good for, and this is why you almost got to be careful when you just. You know, ah, I'm going to get rid of this book. Doesn't have any heat. Uh, sometimes, if a book is so not rare but just not collected, it makes it more attractive. Because sooner or later, somebody's going to look for it on eBay. I mean, I, we talked about the uh, malevolent nun, uh, two issues from Fangraphics that I was going to give to my sister for her birthday, but she's over in Italy now for a month teaching class. Uh, I'm trying to get her to go to a comic store there and uh, see what kind of fun things she can bring back. But she said the one she went through, went to the previous years is gone. So, you know, comic apocalypse isn't just happening here in the States. Uh, so anyways, I, 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 I sold a set of a comic that apparently one of the comics is so rare that not even my go-to comic list, AtomicAvenue.com had it listed. I'm talking about a series called Captain Armadillo. They list issues one through four, but I had an issue five in the set. Matter of fact, one guy's got issue four listed at $20. I sold my my entire run for 10 bucks because that's the type of guy I am. 
I have no idea what the book was about. It came out in 91. Writer Phil Sanderlin, artist Bill Staten. Um, 91, that was that was way after the Black and White Glut, wasn't it? Yeah, the Black and White Glut was uh, 86 to 87. And it really kind of, uh, col- it all collapsed in 87, which took out tons of comic distributors. And um, from what I am reading, about a third of all comic shops. And people seem to have forgotten just how devastating it was. We went from tons of comic distributors down to five. Yeah. By the time it was That was all before done. the 90s started, even. Yeah. I will it's, say... Um, I- it nearly... Ki- well, it nearly killed um, Kitchen Sink. Uh, um, what else? Eclipse had to deal with that and then a huge flood, which destroyed all their inventory and a lot of their film. So Eclipse just kind of limped along after that, barely staying alive. I I will say on on the cover of one of the Captain Armadillos, it says, The adventure begins. See an ordinary comic book collector miraculously transformed into an idiot in a stupid armadillo suit. Now that's the type of stuff. That's probably why I bought this series. Cause I, it sounds like my life. It does. It's, although you're not an armadillo suit. You're more of a cleaner. So, anyways, it's gone. But in the meantime, I'm putting all sorts of stuff up on the Ebays. I'm not only uh, – the stuff I donated that didn't sell is going back up. So, if you uh, were looking at something and it just suddenly disappeared, oh, well, go take a look. It's probably going to be back. And, of course, as listeners to this here show, I always like to give – uh, deals. So just uh, drop me a note. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll uh, give you something uh, free. Uh, all the shipping's free. I can't I can't entice you with that. Uh, and like I said, I actually uh, I gave away a couple copies of Worldwide News. Corey and Dan donated them a couple years ago to the uh, the charity booth, and we've sold copies. But uh, I had a few left, and I just I made sure people that at least know who you two are had a copy. And besides, they weren't autographed, so they're not worth anything anyways. But uh, People know who we are. K-R-A-Y-Z. Check it out. Come get some. And now we get to my favorite part of the show. No, 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 not where I put the headset down and go outside and finish reading that novel I was talking about because it's beautiful outside. Oh. No, it's freaking a geeking. Joe, what are you freaking on? <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah, I, I don't know if I call this the con crud because I didn't catch it at the con. There were plenty of people hacking and coughing. And, you know, we did like what Corey and I always say, you know, you wash your hands, especially after dealing with money. Make a, a, a conscious effort not to put your hands near your eyes, your nose, your mouth, which it almost instantly makes you get that itch right on the outside. You know, that little indentation under the nose. and Use tons of uh, Purell. Yeah, we had that going. Um, And it's weird because the last con I was at, I would use a lot of Purell, and there were some uh, people who were, like, glaring at me when I did it. (laughs) And then, you know, you'd read their Facebook page the next day. It's, "Uh, I don't feel so good. I feel Uh, great. (laughs) I feel great. Yeah, I don't think I got it at the con because, again, I went to the con. It was fine. We went up north couple days came back we were fine but when i got to work everybody's got it i mean i just basically walked into a petri dish and sure enough by the end of the day you get that itch on the back of your throat and uh earlier today i was just up and i was hacking you know, I, I i gotta just do what i always do i get up have a little oc i have my caffeine which is usually diet mountain dew take a shower take some ibuprofen uh i got benadryl in case i need it but uh you know, and I, I once I get out of here, we're done with the podcasting. I'll be going outside because I'm going to start reassembling the garage. But yeah, I'm, I'm I'm feeling it. So got a couple days off now. Uh, we're recording this, and uh, this will, will it drop on Memorial Day? No, we're doing a fill-in for Memorial Day oh. because there's no way I will get this mixed in time for oh, tomorrow. Okay. I thought here, I thought tonight. Here I was, Okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll just get rid of this because I was going to give a big praise about how Corey's editing skills are part none. But, the, oh, well. But I, 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 it's late, but I will say thank you to all the vets and veterans out there at Memorial Day. I know you've sacrificed a lot. And uh, uh, hopefully Joe, we'll I am going to correct you. Don't thank the veterans. You do that on Veterans Day. 
Memorial well, Day is for the people who died. Well, see, you didn't. You cut me off too quick because I was yes, going to. I, I was going to talk about Turbo and about how we, we talk a lot about the friends that he lost while he was working in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I, I'm keenly aware of what it is, but you can't really thank somebody without, you know, the people who remember the ones who passed away are, are the ones who worked with them. You know, some of us, it's more personal than others. I personally don't know anybody who died overseas, but I know people who do. And I do acknowledge it. And it is it is uh, it's harsh, you know. And we've talked about this before. I think we talked about this on, on an earlier podcast. Anytime you have a death, it's you, you, you cannot get, you will not get back to normal. Eventually, you'll find a new normal. And that's about the, the only advice I can give somebody. But uh, I know for, for Memorial Day, for those of you that uh, have friends and family you're remembering, uh, I'm, I'm remembering it with you. And I also have a little freaking for our local cemetery because they, uh, I, I hope they change, but boy, last year when we went, we went out to uh, say uh, hello to uh, Chris's mom who passed away. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a sprawling cemetery tucked into between major highway and the airport. And they have various gates to go in and out. But for some reason, because it's a holiday and it's a weekend, they only have the main entrance open. You have hundreds if not thousands of people trying to get in and out of that one entrance, everything else is shut down. That, ah, stupid, stupid. You know it's going to be busy this weekend. Open the damn place up. I mean, I went through past it uh, on Friday because now I got my new hours, which is also goofing me up at work. And you're wide open. You can get in any of the entrances, but it's going to be locked up tight. And I, I hope they're not doing it this year. But really, just pay someone to watch the entrance. Just open them up. <sighs> Anyways, that's enough of my freaking. I, I'm going to hawk up some stuff. Corey, what are you freaking on here while I mute myself? <laughs> well, um, last weekend I worked at the group home. But the uh, Friday before I started work, I got an email. Uh, Joe, you know how I said that I, boy, I'm sure excited about when they're going to be shutting down the the, the the campus I work on and we're moving to smaller houses because I will have weekends off and I will you know be full-time sleep staff Sunday night through Thursday night the last Friday I got an email saying um, yep the last day the campus will be open is blah 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 and that job that we uh, promised you and that you have paperwork for yeah that job's not going to exist and we don't know where you're going to be working So that was a real kick in the balls. So, um, and it's funny, we had our training for the new houses the next day. So I'm there in the training and everybody where we, you know, please go around the room and give your name and where you're going to work. And, you know, all the staff. And then it got to me and Corey, don't know yet. And the two people running the training looked at me as like, what do you mean? It's like, I got an email Friday. Um, the position that I had been promised, signed a contract for and everything, doesn't exist. So I'm irritated about the fact that I'm probably going to have to continue to work weekends and such. Um, one of the things about the group home, they don't have a position for me now. It's like the weather in uh, the Midwest. Wait a bit and it'll change. I have no doubt that I will be getting calls and get offers and et cetera, et cetera. But for right now, it's like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to be piecing together a shift at this place, a shift over here, a shift there. Um, I'm not really the, freaking. The question, the question comes, though, do you ever get to the point where you're like, you know what, I'm just checking out and not doing it? Um, financially, I kind of have to. Now, I don't have to work as much as I do. But if I ever want to get out of this house and into one that's better, I have to have a second job. Um, our economy is set up for couples who both work. 
for single people, not so much. You know, my office job pays me enough that I could kind of make it if I cut back on everything. Like eating. Well, you know, I could eat, but I couldn't go anywhere, and I'd have to strip down to basic cable, and I wouldn't be able to buy omnibuses and stuff like that. So, um, for now, I was just going to figure out what's going to be going on. Um, I'm also freaking about the fact that I have to go back to work on Tuesday. Oh, Not that I, it's... I've, I've, I've done, and I, I eased into mine because I went back four hours and then five and then eight. But yeah, yeah, you're, you're jumping in the deep end of the pool with no shorts yep. on. And also I've been uh, going in cause I have to do my time card every week. The emails are all, Oh my God, we're overwhelmed with calls. So I know when I go back on Tuesday, it's just going to be crazy. I'm not upset about it, but I will say this month and a half of being home has been glorious. And um, one of the things that there are two things about it that have been good. The first is that I allowed myself time to recover because I could. I didn't have to go back to work in order to make money. I didn't have to go back to work in order to keep my job. Um, but also, I didn't force myself to do a lot of stuff here around the house. It's no, you had surgery. Your vision is still weird. Allow yourself to recover. And I did. Uh, Comic-wise, I am freaking about the fact that uh, there was a rumor at the beginning of the week that Tom King was being removed from Batman. And then later in the week, DC let him announce that he will be doing a Batman Catwoman series to wrap up his 100-issue run. I don't know how much of that is them going, huh, sales on Batman are going down. Oh, we need to get a new creator on there. How about if, Bendis? Uh, or if this was planned all along, much like how, you know, with um, Scott Snyder on Batman, it's okay, he's going to end this, and then he's going to go over and do that. Or how much of it was like with Grant Morrison, where they had all this editorial stuff happen, and then Grant Morrison said, hey, wait a minute, my story's not over, and you promised me that I would be able to do, you know, I've done ABC, you promised me I would get to do D&E. Now you're doing this new 52 shit that's going to ruin my story. Much like what happened to Jeff Johns with his Green Lantern story where, oh, gosh, look, new 52's hitting. Um, I'm in the middle of a pre-planned story. Or maybe they just said, hey, Bendis, you got time to do a Batman book? Yeah, whatever. Well, we haven't heard who will be doing the new Batman, so. But anyway, it was poorly handled. Um, and if you go to Tom King's uh, Twitter feed, when the rumor got out, he was bombarded with messages of people saying, why would DC do this to you? And he was very gracious and very professional where he waited until the, you know, before his announcement, he said, I want to thank everybody for their messages. We have an announcement coming later. And then when he announced the Batman Catwoman's book, he was, you know, here's where I'm going to be ending my story. I want to thank DC for, you know, letting me start a new series, et cetera, et cetera. It just shows that DC, man, their publicity department is terrible. And I don't understand it because they have Warner Communications. Why is their, communica why is their communication so terrible when they have one of the, five biggest media companies in the world. You already, you already know that answer. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> also, um, I haven't been on, I haven't really been uh, online a whole lot while I've been out because I've just been kind of enjoying reading and watching movies and everything. And every time I dip my toe back into uh, what comic fans are doing, it makes me angry. So uh, comic fans are still angry and annoying. And uh, yeah. See, that's why you got to get back going to comic cons because I didn't see anybody angry at the show. It was fun. Joe, what are you geeking on? All right. 
well, not really a lot. I pretty much everything I was geeking on, I, sh- I shot at the beginning of the show. So uh, I am going to so- give a shout out to Amish Baby Machine because they've gotten over their 200th episode, which is cool. Uh, actually, it's kind of fun when uh, I get together with Dags at work because we'll uh, we'll just talk podcasting and stuff. Uh, I am going to say uh, I, this really isn't a geeking as per se, but it was actually a year ago or so when I started the uh, road down, which led to my hip replacement. Because you know, I, I went from the con standing on the the hard concrete to going up north again with my wife on our anniversary and hiking almost every trail. This year, we just went up and hiked around Split Rock because we're just taking it gingerly. And uh, I'm I'm feeling pretty good, although I am feeling the hip is beginning to wear out. And we're talking the left hip this time, not the right. So I I will announce we're going to start Hip Watch 2 starting today. And it's been kind of going on. Uh, By the way, it it has to be named Hip Watch 2 Electric Boogaloo. Electric Boogaloo. Okay, I'm going to write that. Hip Watch 2 Electric Boogaloo. That works for me. now, right now, the only thing that's really happening is uh, I'm just trying to pick up as much overtime at work. And what I'm doing is I'm storing it as uh, comp time because I, now I get an idea just how much comp time I need. Uh, and I, but by, t- by the time uh, I, I won't have enough just with regular sick time and regular vacation pay. So every so often, and this will probably, uh, hopefully, well, we got to get a few fill-ins going because, I mean, it, it's kind of weird because, you know, baggage gets the job done. Most of the comp time is at the checkpoint because that's obviously where they need most of the t- time. And I can go up there and do some of the jobs, uh, not the screening jobs per se, but like doing tickets, uh, uh, doing the exit lane, things like that. But the baggage, it's like they, they're trying to choke us off with tweezers or something, but we need the help. Because what's weird is over the summer, and I don't know why this is such a shock, everybody wants Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. And a lot of people have Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. So we're chronically short Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It only bothers me one day because my new days off are Saturday, Sunday, Monday, which I'll probably get to keep through through the summer. So what I do is I'll come in and I'll, I'll try to pick up five hours here. I did that yesterday. did five hours of comp time and uh upcoming weekend i've got some comp time coming so we'll slowly build it up the the two things i'm building up not only the comp time but also uh in my ebay sales that'll all be kind of stashed away uh last time i had five i think it was four grand set aside which worked out great because unbeknownst to us we didn't realize the government was going to shut down and when it shuts down you can't use any leave uh what happens is the people who did use leave when everything got back up and running because of the way the furlough works, you'd not charge leave. You just basically got free time off. Um, Everybody's like, well, that worked for you. You didn't have any sick time that got charged. I said, well, yeah, but the paycheck right before the the furlough was the last of my sick leave that I used. So I'm at zero again. (sighs) Oh, well, anyway, so that's going on. Uh, if you're really bored, check out May 26, 2015, because we had a supersized podcast that uh, talked about when Corey and I uh, were chatting with uh, Tommy Lange for a discussion about Mad Comics. Uh, and then we talked about my coming of age poker novel, which obviously Corey, because I never did a poker novel. I didn't have to publish it up. And uh, and Corey decided on what class to take for summer to learn something new. Uh, I'm just reading old memory notes from a year ago that popped up. So, yeah, if, if this is your first podcast, welcome in. We got, what, nine years? Over 400 nine episodes? Years. Yeah. And I listened to some of the earlier ones, and, and barring days were cold or drunk, they, they pretty much sound the same. Although we, we do talk about more interesting things now. Sort of, kind of. Well, not really. Anyways, how about you, Mr. Strode? What are you geeking on? Um... Infinite Crisis. Again? Yep, I have the uh, omnibus, and I am reading it. The damn thing is huge. It's yeah. you, you could use it to stun a. You could use it to to stun a charging horse, and um, 
it just reminds me that was a period of comics. You had Infinite Crisis and um, Civil War, and it seemed like DC and Marvel were just firing on all cylinders. It was such a fun time to be reading comics. And this is much better than the other DC um, Omni than the Marvel omnibuses around the Infinity stuff because this has it all in order. And I forgot all of these different miniseries that tied in with it and in and out. And as I'm reading it, the one thing that really hits me is editorial did such an amazing job of getting all of these things to dovetail with each other. Um, and then after that was uh, 52 and um, Marvel immediately snapped up the editor of 52 because it's like, holy crap, he's able to get out a weekly comic with all these different creative teams. This guy's got to work for us. So, um, I like comics now. I told you I'm reading uh, War of the Realms, but this was a time when, you know, I was just so excited. Every week it felt like something exciting was happening. And it's one of the few times you're able to go back and just get that same feel again. Um, on Marvel Unlimited, they reprinted all 12 issues of Planet Terry. Does Joe know? What was Planet Terry? Uh, it was a uh, book, I believe, from uh, Wildstorm image uh it, it had uh uh boy it's been a long time i do have the omnibus sitting no, on no, my no. piano Not planetary and, oh planet terry oh uh, was that a starline comic yes uh you know and the weird thing was i actually saw those books the graphic novels for sale at the con but i didn't pick any up and i didn't pick it up then so although i'm aware of it i don't know what it is um dave manick wrote it and if you don't know who Dave Manick is, that means you didn't read Cracked Magazine because he was a cartoonist for Cracked Magazine. And Werner Klemper, no, 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 not that Werner Klemper, who, who drew uh, Harvey comics. And what happened was when Harvey went under, there was actually um, Shooter was trying to put together a deal to buy the Harvey comics line. And at the end of it, Harvey said, no. We're going to keep it because we think we can monetize this some other way. But it meant that all the people who worked for Harvey were out of work. So they created the Star Comics line to A, have a kid's line, and B, to hire up the people who were working for Harvey. And Planet Terry was one of those books. I did not read it at the time because I was in college, and I'm not going to read a kid's book unless it's uh, by Carl Barks or Don Rosa. But it's a series, um, science fiction series that lasted 12 issues where the lead character, Terry, was trying to find his parents. And he would go planet to planet. And I, I still don't know why they reprinted it as a $40 book. But reading it on Marvel Unlimited, it's a fun little series. Um, I think if they would have reprinted it in a smaller, cheaper format, it could have sold through Scholastic and everything. I think a $40 <laughs> high-end reprint is silly. Um, the uh, DC app added a metric shit ton of new comics. It's still a pain in the ass to get through, but if you get through it... Um, there's tons of stuff on there, uh, mostly um, books from the last 20 or so years, but they do have some of the older stuff. So there's been a lot of that. Uh, I've been reading, I've been catching up on Back Issue and Alter Ego. So there's lots of comics history that will be popping up on the podcast. And I also want to remind people, Joe, tell the listeners what the hero initiative is <clears throat> heroes initiative hero singular i always say heroes because it's it's more than one person doing it but hero initiative is a uh, 
charitable organization that popped up because a lot of the creators that made the, our favorite books that Corey and I rave about for nine years, 400 plus shows, end up destitute, alone, they make no money, they're kind of shunted to decide the most famous, uh, of course, were the creators of Superman, who were, when the movie was starting to come out, were what, living in a, in a group home alone? I, 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 it was just amazing. Millions, if not billions of money, dollars have been made. But the Hero Initiative helps these creators. Uh, if it's medical, if it's uh, uh, just try financial, to work. Try, try to find work, work, keep their home, whatever. Uh, that's why the uh, con was proud to include them in part of our charity because now we actually are uh, dealing with two organizations that, that help the comic industry as well. Uh, they have their own site. They put stuff on the Ebays. Uh, you can donate directly. Uh, and so there's a lot of ways that you can get in and, and help their organization, help the creators who made the books you've enjoyed over these many decades. Um, I wanted to bring up um, one of the uh, creators who's been at the con a lot of times, hasn't been able to come for the past couple of years, and that's Liz Safen Barubi. And um, she posted recently on the Hero Initiative. My name is Liz Safem Barubi. I've colored and illustrated comics for DC, Neil Adams Continuity Graphics, TSR, and more since 1960. I've always managed to keep myself afloat, but smooth sailing is not always life's direction. In 2017, I found myself facing a two-year surgical recovery with a hip and femur held together with wire and screws. I'd only be able to use one toe to transfer from bed to wheelchair for over a year. My choices were an assisted living facility or a home for the aged and disabled. I was in more pain than humans should be allowed to endure and ridden with anxiety, loneliness, and withdrawal. My social life is my therapy. The prospect of being isolated was a dark one. Then Hero Initiative gave me the funds to return to my home with caregivers to help with everyday living. They provided a wonderful lounge chair that will help me continue to draw in comfort. Nothing is happening quickly except for the help from Hero, which arrived immediately. They even got me in touch with people in my neighborhood I can call should I want or need to go to art shoes art shows, museums, or conventions. Hero Initiative is an organization to be applauded. About a year ago, I talked about on the podcast, I sold off most of my original art to donate to the Hero Initiative. This is one of the reasons why. Um, we've talked about Russ Heath, who was in his 90s when he passed away. One of the things the Hero Initiative did, he was in his 90s and most of his friends had passed away because you know, he was in his 90s. The Hero Initiative actually reached out to people where he lived to go spend time with him, take him out to lunch, um, comic creators, comic fans, people in the neighborhood, so that he wasn't alone. Um, the Hero Initiative does more than just give money for people's medical. They help you connect with services to assist in things like Liz has talked about or with Russ Heath. Um, there are comic creators. If you go to the Hero Initiative site, you'll actually see these are creators who are looking for work. So um, I was very happy to read that Liz put that up. She's got a fundraiser on her Facebook page. Um, and just and reading just... the stories of what the Hero Initiative does makes me feel really good about the money that I've given. And I'm going to mention, I, while you were talking, I went on their eBay site because you can go to their, their regular uh, site as well. But on the Ebays, they got some interesting things, which I'm just going to recommend. Uh, first off, they have their exclusive cover for the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide, which this year is done by Joe Jusco. Jusco? Did I say that right? I never yes. say it right. Doesn't matter. Uh, if you're, we've talked in the past about how old hardcovers of Overstreet are actually valuable. Theirs even more so because they only make 500 and they're only available through here. Uh, they also have the Hero Initiative Notebook, which I absolutely love. I gave them as Christmas gifts. They're only about five bucks with shipping, almost like the original sketchbook. And what's happening now is people are doing sketches and putting them up on their Facebook page. I'm sorry, as on the eBay page as part of their uh, auctions where all the proceeds will go to that. 
If you're looking for an Action 100 print signed by Dan Jurgens or Kevin and Kevin Nolan, they got it. They have a triple signed Stan Lee, Joe Quesada, Mike Mayhew print, one left. Uh, also, the Heroes Initiative does a lot of what they call the 100 projects, which I absolutely love. They take a property like Wonder Woman, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Batman, Wolverine. They get 100 creators, maybe more, to do a special comic blank cover. And then through the throughout the year, they auction off these covers. And they come from major names to, to local names that you and I have talked with. And then the Heroes Initiative puts it all together in not only a limited edition hardcover, which is fabulous, but also a soft cover for some of you like me that suffer through middle class poverty. And they are for sale. If you wanted the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle 100 Project hardcover, 25 bucks plus shipping. If you wanted the soft cover, 15. And these are absolutely fun. Way back when I talked about the uh, swimsuit issue of Amazing Heroes, where you just see a ton of artists putting out their best. This is a fun way to do that as well. They still got the Ultimate Spider-Man up. Uh, if, you, if you're looking for the hardcover, and I highly recommend these, buy them direct from the source. I've bought them uh, off and on through the years, and I've lost track of which ones I have, but they are just a blast to look at, to collect. And then, of course, you run around, and they, they give you blank pages in the back. So if you run across another creator who wants to add his creation to your notebook, you're, uh, you're, you're in luck, fella. But again, Heroes Initiative, uh, they just... Look for them on the eBay store, or uh, if you type in Hero Initiative in eBay search, it'll come up almost immediately. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books. Well, mostly it's been Joe blathering on about No, things. no, you had a good, uh, here's what I said on my ass reading moment. <laughs> And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most, Joe. Now, we all know our good friend Dave Coffell. Uh, you know, nice guy, good musician, got a crafted mix of folks, blues, jazz, country classics. And a thick head of hair. Yeah, I know. He's just a master of, of, of almost anything. And of course... He is going on a whirlwind blitz in the Midwest of touring and shows. I mean, he averages almost 200 shows a year, maybe more, and he loves it. He loves traveling. He loves meeting all kinds of people. They do the podcast, uh, Scrabbling Across America. Did I get that one right? Yes, you did. I did. Boy, I'm, I'm getting better at this. You'd think after nine years. Anyways, he's got some shows coming up. June 6th, he'll be at Maple Grove, Minnesota, June 7th. Uh, Yankton, South Dakota, June 8th, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And that's just the beginning. He's given me a ton of MP3s. We're going to follow him over the next couple weeks. And uh, if you get a chance, go out and see him. I'm, I'm hoping I can see him soon. I'm just looking because, I, again, I got weekends off. Oh, on, on uh, the 27th of uh, June, he'll be in Roseville, Minnesota. And I'm off the 27th. Oh, hang on a second. Ah, darn it. I might, I'm signed up for overtime. I might have to. Sorry. Sorry. I, I, I really, I really want to get out and see him perform. Uh, but as I said before, he has graciously allowed us to uh, show off some of his songs here. This week, Matthew's Boat. So without further ado, Corey, hit my music. 